Welcome back to a lifetime of Mafia Tales. Today, Sal and I discuss Colombo crime family capo slash hitman Greg Scarpa Sr. Greg was in the Colombo crime family for over 40 years. On the other side of that, though, he was working with the government for over 30 plus years as well. Throughout his time on the street, Greg did some very sick things and got away with most of them. Greg had many books about his life come out through over the years. I'll put them in the video description. I highly recommend them. They are all full of good information. There's so much information about him that we couldn't cover it all in one video. So we'll be doing a part two next week. So if you got any comments or questions or anything you want me and Sal to throw in the next video, please comment and let us know. Also, please be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel for more videos like this. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our Patreon channel for exclusive stories about Greg Scarpa and all the other content we've put out throughout the last months. But without further ado, let's get into Greg Scarpa Sr.'s story. All right, welcome back, everyone. Today, me and Sal got another interesting episode. Today, we're going to be covering Greg Scarpa Sr., and we're going to do this in a part one and a part two series because there's just, again, a lot of information on this guy, just like there was with Anthony Castle. So, Sal, with Greg Scarpa, man, I'll, I can kind of give the whole little background of him, but before we do get into it, I mean, what, what were your overall thoughts or anything on the street that you heard about uh, Greg Scarpa? Well, way back, I mean, you know, 70 years ago in the, in the uh, 19, I'm sorry, 50 years ago in the 1970s, you know, Cataldo was very protective of his relationships with the guys inside the Colombo crew. So I didn't get to know much about who he was. Most of it was a lot of rumor. Of course, years later when, when stuff started coming out and, you know, the FBI went public with, with the things that he had got involved in the eighties, I was shocked to understand how long he had been an undercover operative and they called him a TE, which was a top echelon informant. Yeah, he was... So uh, I'm not sure whether he did it for the money I don't know. I didn't know his personality, but there's a good chance he not only did it for the money because he he envisioned himself as a super agent working for the government, working undercover. I mean, this is what he told his daughter, Linda, who I had many conversations with uh, some years ago when she was writing her book. Well, she was ve very impressed with who he was as a as a father and a man. Yeah, well, um, I can get into him after I give a little background on him. And from what I did on my end was I read the book, a couple books on Greg Scarpa. And then, of course, did some research online. And I could tell you what was the overall assumption, why he became an informant. And but there's there's a couple reasons, really, I, I believe. But um, so with Greg Scarpa, he was he worked his way up and through the Profaci family. Then, of course, it changed over to the Colombo family, and he really gained a lot of respect. And he was over, overall, I guess he was in that family for 30, 40 years. But wow. bet between that time, he was an informant for 30 years of it, so three decades, man. And he uh, he was very active during the third Colombo War. But if he w went back all the way to the first one, I mean, he, he's been around for quite a while, so... He would be a, he was able to be a part of mostly all the wars that were going on and that the, the whole reason he became an informant was because he got busted in the, for hijacking in 1959 and so the first information he really started giving up was about uh, the whole Gallo versus Profaci war and this is when he shortly started getting paid after after giving them information like that and of course they helped him get out of this hijacking charge and plenty right. more throughout his whole career with the FBI. But Amazing. that's what was his, why he became an informant on that end. But he also wanted an insurance policy. He, he knew if he was going to have some kind of long-term career in this. And of course, like you said, he wanted to be like an undercover agent. Well, here's a couple, couple reasons right there, man. There's three of them. Right. Right. And, um, Let's see. The information was given to him by the feds, and he helped them. They they helped him really become a capo because they he was acting as if they were giving him information, which they might have been, 
but he was using it for even to further the Colombo crime family's operations as well. So he was getting information to the feds and they were giving him some and he was able to work his way up in that family. It's amazing, amazing the level of uh, involvement that he had within the FBI and with with the guys on the street and the type of crimes that he committed. I mean, he actually, I, when I read or when I talked to his daughter, he did see himself as omnipotent. He, he saw himself as a special character and that he wasn't going to be, uh, you know, kept according to the law. He could do whatever he wanted to do on one side and then also kill as many people as he wanted to kill inside, inside the life. So for him, I think he did envision himself as to have the best of both worlds. He could do whatever crime he wanted to and get away with it. Um, in 1950, that's when he became a made man. and He was only 25 years old. And then 10 years later, he would go on to become an a capo. And 19, 1950, it says? When he was 25. Yeah, 1950. Really? Yeah, that's wow. when, yeah, in the book, this, well, in a couple books, it said that so. Like I said, a lot of these probably got to be court documents, other people's statements and stuff. But right again, like we like we always say with these books and stuff, we leave it up to the people whether they believe in the information or not. It's just yeah, we'll, we just kind of report what we see. But this um, Greg ended up giving up the, the FBI, the whole structure of the mafia, too, from the boss to the bottom, you know, all the associates and everything that he was aware of and. He gave him the current bosses and just everyone that was a part of the mob that he knew about. He was given given the feds information on that. And, and he also gave him the story of what it was like to become a made guy. It's amazing. And of course, they even sent him on missions and stuff, too. Um, you know, you know, the whole stuff with the whole KKK. There was a couple of different instances on that. Are you aware of any of them? Yeah, the one in Mississippi when he went down there to find the killers who had killed some, uh, you know, killed a few black people. He went and got the information and forced, I guess he put a gun in somebody's mouth and forced the guy to tell him the truth. Yeah, and he then passed that information on to J. Edgar Hoover. That alone sounds so amazing that he was able to to do that stuff that hoover had had the ability to set him up with fbi agents to pre protect him enough so that the government could get information that's true because this is a this is a pretty much a big deal because they sent him not only once but like two or three times to right to inter and you know do and <laughs> do his thing that he was doing to these kkk members and trying to get information from them and just really trying to figure out how their organization worked yeah. as well as giving up how the the mafia structure and everything else. So he was sent there a couple of times and he just really wanted to get information on who these KKK guys were killing, right. who did it, right. why did they do it, and that was pretty much it. Who, where, why, just, just whatever he could get out of these guys. And then he'd report it back to the the feds. And then, of course, he was rewarded. <laughs> Give him some money. Not much money. They didn't give him much money in those days. Oh, yeah, probably not as much as uh, when he was making, especially with the family operations, too. Yeah, so he was able to continue his criminal activities in and around Brooklyn or whatever and then keep the feds, you know, keep them posted on what he was doing but i'm sure he worked in strange ways giving them bits and pieces of information that he wanted them to have and then also not sharing all kinds of information it's, it's it sounds amazing to me how he kept kept track of all of this well even in like 1968 greg gave information that put 50 criminals away the FBI started to think that maybe he was just doing it to further his own operations in the family. So they, they had that in the back of their head that yeah, yeah. that he, he may be doing that. And so they, they eventually caught on, but I think at the same time he was giving them so much information that yeah. they probably didn't want to 
give that up or who knows, maybe they did sit down and have conversations with him about it, but there was only a couple handlers that yeah. he dealt with. He wasn't going to deal with all the other guys. So the public should know that when I um, flipped in 1984 in uh, September, I met first FBI agent I ever talked to, and I met Ed McDonald. And I was also involved with ATF. ATF is Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Division of and of the government. And what they did in those days, this is 40 years ago, is they wanted me to purchase guns. I don't know if you read any anything about this. I'm trying to give a insight to how the government worked. And so, uh, yeah, I knew a couple of guys upstate New York that were selling guns. So I went and I made these purchases of these guns. And it was undercover. And the feds, they didn't arrest anybody on the spot. They left it alone. And so that the public knows how this stuff sort of unfolds. Let's suppose because it was like maybe the spring of 1985. So the FBI and ATF both agreed that they would use me to make certain purchases, get involved in some crime, and then they would hold the case after after we made the buy. I introduced them to a gun runner, and then they didn't bust that guy for like a long time. Hmm. Everything was predicated on the judge, Judge Brennan's case. So they were holding that those cases that I, I bought bombs and I bought guns. I don't know if you know this. No, I didn't know that part. Yeah. So what the government does, they hold these cases until they make the final decision to go public with the big case, which was the judge. And then after they arrest the judge and whoever else they were arresting on the Judge Brennan case, then they went and they arrested these guys who were bombers, building bombs, and trading in guns. Now, this is, don't forget, this is 1985. Sounds like a Rico. Rico yeah, this conspiracy. is a long time. Yeah, this is a long time before 9-11. And the government wasn't really that focused on guns and bombs in the 80s. They were focused on the mob. So, uh, you know, like I said, I, I made the introduction. They, they wired everything up. They videoed my purchases. And then off we went. And we continued on the Brennan case. So in looking at the things that Scarper did, I can imagine the number of criminal cases that were pending while he was an active confidential informant. And eventually he became um, a cooperating witness. I don't know if he ever testified. Did you read about anything that he ever testified? The only thing that I seen that he went into court and testified about was that he... Remember when he contracted AIDS, the, the hospital, he sued them because they had they didn't test the blood that they put right. in his body. So he was able to take them to court. And then from one of the books I read, I think he got three hundred thousand dollars. So, I mean, that was the only thing I ever seen him testify in. But OK, so maybe, all the years that went by, he never once went to court and testified. He might have, but not that not that I've seen. Yeah, reading these books, uh, you would think they would have been in the books. That's how secret they keep all these investigations. Could you imagine the amount of cases that he was involved in and how they lined them up, eventually thinking that they were going to arrest a lot of these guys that he gave information on, but well, he didn't. He didn't testify. That's interesting to me. I think probably during all this time that. They had to have bust people if he was doing it for 30 years. Yeah. They had to have went and arrested people or said, I don't know what his, his situation was back then. Obviously, it was completely different from any other informant. Right. Yeah, so I, I don't know. It was like a long term relationship that they had with him. So, yeah. Whatever it may have been, he help them get a lot of information about how the mafia worked, the operations, right. the day-to-day -day activities, what they were, what each boss was involved with that he knew and what the crew members were doing and what murders were going on. He was giving them information about that. And I remember reading too, that there was a murder that 
he did himself, but his crew was around. And he ended up saying that he gave information about where the body was and all that stuff, but not who actually took the guy out, which was him. He didn't tell them that, but there was a lot of different incidents like that. So yeah, during his time too, though, he backed off of being an informant after his previous one, because he had one in the beginning and then the second one, he was approached by Linda Vecchio. And this was like after five years. He, so he was like never not given information for five years or so, but then he was approached by Linda Vecchio and then, he started working up again and giving him information. And then the kind of a little background on Lynn from the books that I read, it said that he gotten, well, just like you had mentioned what you had did, he was selling firearms to undercover ATF agents. So he was on the other side, he was selling them. So while you were setting them up, he was, he was selling them. So he ended up uh, being able to become the, head of the Bonanno and Colombo squads in the FBI. So he was, he was a higher up guy in that organization, you know, the FBI and yeah. everything. Yeah. But let's see. So what do you think about that? The relationship there? Well, look, the guy had to be extremely masterful at, at all that he did because he was living the way I see it. He was living two or three different lives. He was living one life as a criminal. Then he was living another life as a, an informant for the FBI and only allowing them to know what he wanted them to know, okay? And then uh, he was living um, openly as a mob hitman. So whether or not, you know, mob guys used him to kill people, who knows? God only knows in those days... There wasn't a lot of information on bodies that were found or some that bodies were never found. And it was like my relationship with Cataldo. I know he was killing people, but a lot of the times he got involved in murders and they didn't want the bodies to be found. So they would get him to, you know, a place where they would crush him up, uh, you know, in a car or they would him and Donnelly had a boat. Well, they would take that body out on a boat and go out in the ocean and dump the body. So there was many times where they didn't want, organized crime didn't want bodies found because with no body, there was almost no chance of a murder charge. Then occasionally they wanted the body found as a message. So So for the most part, they just get rid of it then. Yeah, a lot of times they got rid of the bodies, but sometimes they wanted to leave those bodies to show that the guy was maybe undercover, an undercover operative. Uh, But this is like the 80s when it was very difficult to keep information, you know, away from the public. What was said actually was that one of uh, Lynn DeVecchio's underlings had came to him and said that there was information that there was two murders out on, on the Vicarina faction done by the Persico faction. And so Linda Vecchio, his response was apparently, oh, yeah, we're going to win this thing. And so he, they ended up, I believe, that underling, whoever it may have went, Ben, they went to court and they had to give that information up. So that really did not look good for him in court at all. But he ended up beating his charges. He yeah, didn't year, years it. later. Yeah, years, years later. Yeah, he had worked, didn't he work like 15 years with Scarpa? Probably. I would think their relationship was quite a long time up until he he was dying, until he had to go to jail, and then before he was sentenced. Well, he died in, what, 93? Yeah, I think so. Wow. That's about right, yeah, when he ended. And And he got his kids involved. He got, you know, both his kids were involved. And, yeah, that, that's another thing that we could get into. Because, like I said, we'll probably do, you know, we'll do the part one series, part two series on Greg Scarpa. But then we can do a separate episode on his his daughter, Linda, and then another one on Greg Scarpa Jr. So that's right. overall full, four episodes. But they all got their own stories. And, and what about the young son, Joe, Joe, Joseph? Oh, yeah, him too. We could bring him up in one of the 
either one yeah. of the episodes, but yeah, it is another, you know, bringing the family into the life, man. It's just yeah. a terrible thing, but <clears throat> you know, we'll, we'll be able to cover them and stuff as well. But you, you brought up his family. And so I'll, I'll go, go into a little background about from what I read yeah. and overall during his time, I think he had three wives. He had one with his first wife, I can't recall her name, but he had Greg Scarpa Jr. And then the second one he had was with Linda, not Linda Senior, I suppose you can call her. And then big, uh, they called her Big, big Linda. Linda. Yeah, yeah, usually seniors for like dudes and stuff, I guess. But yeah, yeah Linda, uh, Big Linda, yeah, was. Then he had a children with her, which yeah. was Joey, and then Linda, Linda, little Linda, and then the third one was like with some she was like some kind of uh model or something and right so he, he had all uh, you know kind of a couple different families and stuff but overall he was what they had said was that he was a great father or a great family member that they had and that they saw him as someone they cared and loved about but then they heard the stories they seen him, they heard his stories even from him yeah and re- really what what it came down to and what it was really what he was about. And it definitely scared them. And I don't know. It, it just, it sucked them into the life just as much. Right. Right. Going on, you know, a little bit furthermore from a couple murders that he had did was there was this one instance when Alley boy Persico remember you can't, you cross paths with this guy when you're in the witness protection program. Right. Well, during his time when he was on the run, which would have been when you ran into him, he was on the run f- from going to prison. Years. Yeah. A couple of years. Yeah. 85, 86, like that, 87. Well, Greg Scarpa wanted to find out where he was. He wanted to get information to find out where he was. And so probably the reason being he wanted to give the feds that information so they could go and bust him. And then, but the thing was that the way that Greg went about getting this information was that he ended up killing the mistress of uh, Alley Boy Persico, and she had no clue where he was or any of that kind of stuff, and he ended up shooting her in the head. Wow, was yeah. that the girl that he invited to a club? Yeah, and he, I think they were going to offer her a job and everything. Mary, Mary Barry, or something. Yep, that's right. That's exactly right. Wow, but she was. Obviously needing money since he was gone, Alley Boy, and then they offered her a job and kind of they obviously manipulated her and tricked her to going there, and then that w- that was it, man. They took her out and did they say what they did with her body? I'm not sure because the case was they said that even Junior may have been involved, but the case was dismissed against him. So I, I really don't know if there was a whole lot of. Uh, evidence to where that where that would have went because if he didn't give them that information because he would only he was pretty biased about what information he was going to give them but right right i don't know man it it sounds phenomenal to me because knowing how it works on the street if you're working for the government you're supposed to be focused on what what their interests would be and yet he had so many other irons in the fire i mean all the people he was dealing with my goodness with the way he was making money with robberies and drugs and shakedowns and everything it sounds to me like it's an amazing uh daily activity for this guy scopper because you know the feds didn't only del vecchio know a little bit of what he was doing well he made sure to the, the main person he trusted the most from what I understand was from his, from the books and stuff was that it was his wife, big Linda. And that she even said that Greg told her everything that he was involved with or anything that he was going to be doing. And so she even said that in 1962, that he told her that he killed over 20 people. So that was back in 62. And that wasn't, that was just kind of like the beginning of his whole, his whole reign in the, the mob and working wow. for the FBI and stuff. But that's amazing. 62, because he was in the middle of the seventies and the eighties, 
He was killing people for 20 years and getting away with it. I mean, you talk about a mass killer. Well, even Larry Mazza said that Greg stopped counting after 50, 50 people. Wow. Who knows how many it really came yeah. down to, but he was only really convicted of a couple in the end. Yeah, terrible. And, yeah, he ended up dying in prison, but that's what we'll really cover in part three, a lot, a lot of that. Yeah. But, I mean, I don't know, man. There's a lot of information about him, but there was only yeah. a couple that they could really make stick. And then those, of course, they were able to get him to go there, go to prison, because that's where they wanted him to be. Yeah. For all the stuff that he did over the years. But he was pretty careful about what he did. And when, when he would know an arrest was coming to someone in his crew, he would let them know, and he said he had a source in the FBI. Right. And right. So, of course, I mean, you said every cop or you know every mob guy had a cop on their payroll, but in those days, yeah, everybody had some kind of connection to law enforcement who would give them information. So, I mean, it wouldn't be too far fetched for some, no. some of these guys to believe that. No. 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 Little did they know. Little did the other guys in the mob know that he was also giving information he was a double double that's what they called him i mean yeah. it sounds so amazing that he got a, that he got away with all these murders for all these years don't forget um jed Hoover died in 1972 and so once the fbi was taken over by a new leader you have to understand if you can read about who j edgar hoover was i mean he he controlled the FBI himself, just himself. So by the time the 70s came, Scarpa was running. He, he could do whatever he wanted to do because now he had information, you know, from, from FBI agents who didn't share it with others. The whole organization was going through uh, massive changes in the 70s, which allowed Scarpa to, to get away with whatever he wanted to get away with. You'd have to know how, how the government worked, by the way. I know, and that's just the thing. It's like he uh, he, he knew how they worked. Yeah. He was able to really understand like how to manipulate both sides, and that's what right. he did. There I was think an... it'll be interesting when we open up, you know, this whole scopper part one uh, to the public for, for Q&A, you know, to talk about it. Well, some people come on, they're going to know certain bits of information that have been unknown for years and years. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I mean, that's, that's just true. one book that was written about him. How many books were written about him? I think there was a couple of them, man. Yeah. There's going to be a couple. There's, yeah, yeah. Maybe even more than that, because even the ones about the, the kids, they're a lot based on what, what the father did. So yeah. even in there, there's a lot of information. But Another murder that he was involved with was one of the most loyal crew members reported in his crew. He had took it out, and his name was Joe Brewster. You familiar with him or heard about him? No, I never heard much about a guy named Brewster, no. Well, what had happened was there was a few things that happened. Um, so Greg Jr., Joe Brewster, and a few other guys went on a heist, and they left because they were informed the police were coming. So Joe Brewster got away clean, but went back to get the rest of them, and then they all got arrested, which that, that that's one thing that they say, but I don't know for sure, but there, that's one reason that was speculated. But then also in 1987, Greg Sr. and Jr. told um, Joe Brewster to put his nice suit on. Greg Jr. was... You know, they must have called and they must have said, hey, you're going to we're going to go do something nice or you're going to get made. I don't know if he was a made guy or not, but, if you know, the meaning of put a nice suit on usually means you're right. going to get made or something. But they were just hanging out at a bar and and then I suppose Greg Sr. pulled up or no, Greg Jr. was the one that did this. So Greg Jr. ended up getting him in a car and then he ended up shooting him in the backside of the head. And then the reason they were they wanted to kill him was because they said he was using cocaine. He was he's not wanting to do hits for Greg Senior anymore. He started to have this interest in religion and not letting Greg Senior in on robberies he was doing alone. 
So this was the this was what what was reported. Yeah, these these were a few instances that were reported, but I can't. I mean, I, I'm sure maybe if in the book, did they find his body? Yeah, they left it in the middle. They didn't do nothing with it because they. It was, this was just getting in and getting out. I maybe was wanting to leave a message, but what they said was, yeah, he was in the car. The car was still running and the air conditioning was on. Did Greg Jr. admit to killing him? <laughs> now that I'm not totally for sure. He must have because, like I said, it was in this book. It was reported and he went away for a long time for you know a couple of things. He, quite a few things he had did, but I mean, how else would they have gotten this kind of information? In these books, I mean, if someone's just making it up, I don't know. But so the it, father, father got the, the son involved in the murder, and did Greg Jr. get convicted for that murder? He probably did down the road, not right away, wow. not 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 right away because terrible. But this this uh, you know eventually really hurt them guys. They, this was a really, I mean, it was like apparently like Greg's son. Another, it just is what they referred to him as because he was just so liked by them but so he was cold and callous i mean if he killed this guy who was most loyal to him and then he killed other people that were close to him he he was cold he was a cold-blooded killer scarpa yeah i mean that's just what it is man and that life that's a terrible way to yeah to end up and do that stuff but <clears throat> To kind of wrap up, too, I wanted to bring up that there was even mention of Greg and Anthony Casso. They were involved in the Bypass Gang. Remember we did an episode yeah. on that? And yeah. yeah. Greg even offered Casso to come into the Colombo family at one point. He did. That's what it said. Yeah. But he, he didn't want to. Obviously, he, wanted to work, he already, he's already working his way up in the Lucchese family, man. Yeah. It's just amazing the amount of criminality that he was involved in and how much he shared with the government and how much he didn't share. Um, you know, because when I talked to Linda, his daughter, she was very open about who her dad was and how much she cared about him. Right. And it was terrible. The whole family went through all this torment, uh, you know, with this, his brother being killed, Joseph. Her uncle, Sal Scarpa, was killed by by her father. I mean, his brother went to jail for years and years and was involved in all kinds of secret, you know, investigations to do with, you know, the first bombing of the World Trade Center. I mean, there was so much involved there. And I'm surprised that, you know, someone hasn't really created a movie about, about this guy and who he was and how vicious the guy was he was a vicious killer who got surprised. away and got a pass from the government for years and years i am really surprised that there's not a movie made about him i mean they recently did one about roy DeMeo and the gemini crew which yeah. was not totally true that's i mean it wasn't meant to be but yeah there was uh they, they got a movie made about them i'm surprised that greg scarpa senior and anthony castle haven't had a a movie based on their life come out. Well, I mean, there's yeah, plenty of such sick, sick, demented killers. You know, I mean, there is a lot that's been written about about Docu those two guys. Documentaries as well. Yeah, yeah. those, but nothing like a, a a big movie about them. So no, I mean, you could you, who could like their character? I mean, look at look at Casso when the government said, "Oh, he's too too vicious of a person." To put on the stand, he's not believable with all that he did. So, and they just, both died a miserable death, by the way. Well, that's what Sunday we'll be covering <clears throat> is Anthony Castle, Greg Scarpa, and then uh, Roy DeMeo. All of them had something in common. Yeah, and that was what they had was at their at their death. Ben, like you said, they reap what reap what you sow. We're so, just scratching the surface on these guys. I mean, the public could read read forever about them. Yeah, and we're just whatever information I'm finding in books and yeah. online. That's what I'm going with. So I, I yeah. like I said, I mean, we, I wasn't there. You didn't know Greg nope. Scarpa, but so but we're just what we got for information. This is what we're doing. So yeah, 
please comment any any takeaways that you got from this video because if if there's something that we may have ris misread or anything or you yeah. think that there's some better information that we haven't talked about just let us know so yeah. we can bring it up because we're going to do a part two on this so but the real message and the real key takeaway that i would say is that this guy was involved with this this life this terrible life and look what it really had a major effect on the family the wife the daughter the the son's been just just everything overall i mean it was just a bad outcome so yeah. going down this kind of path man taking this bringing your family into this life even if you don't want to it still yeah. will eventually bleed into your life right. and right. your family's life and then they got to deal with it and then they got to deal with not having a father or people hating their father because he yeah. was a, he's a killer he's he's done doing bad things to people so it just it, it can definitely yeah. leave an effect on everyone and their mental everything just really confusing upbringing that's for sure right right but uh okay you know now we're going to go over to patreon and we're going to cover another exclusive story about greg scarpa that i had researched and if you want to go over there, that's the, in the video description. All you got to do is just click the link, subscribe, and you can get access to all of our exclusive videos over there and pictures and comments and message Sal, all kinds of different stuff that you yeah. can do on there. So, Interesting. These so, yeah. are characters that uh, I don't believe would exist today because I don't believe they could get away with all that, you know, Scopper and Castle did. I mean, the government covered them up for years and years. Uh, what the benefit was for the government was to learn about the organization. You know, people didn't respond, but, you know, the mob was really a cult. It really was a cult. And they put, they put their life and the life of all the members above family. So for, for, for the general public to understand how cultish everything the Italian mob guys did, they would have to do some research and understand it. Sure. Well, with that, we'll head over to Patreon. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you on the next one. Greg Scarpa Sr. has got one sick story. Unfortunately, he got his family stuck into this life and they had to deal with a lot of drama. With part two in our video, you'll understand why his life didn't end well at all. This just goes to show that crime is a dead end and a waste of time. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this video. And again, please comment any questions or topics or anything you want us to bring up on part two's video. Please share this video with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel to get more videos from Sal and myself. Also, please be sure to subscribe to our Patreon channel for only exclusive content that stays on that app. And of course, if you enjoyed this podcast, I think you'll enjoy my other podcast called the Invest in Yourself podcast. On that podcast, I cover all kinds of different redemption stories. I interview ex-gangsters, ex-mobsters, former drug addicts, and all kinds of different people. The way you can access that podcast is by clicking the same YouTube channel and going to the playlist tab and clicking the Invest in Yourself podcast. Thank you again so much for watching. And of course, we'll see you on the next one. If you would like to support our podcast, we got a few items that you can purchase. All of these items can be found in the video description below. The first one is Sal's book, The Sinatra Club. You can get this personally autographed by Sal. The next one in our hottest seller is the 1972 Sinatra Club playing cards. Back in Sal's Mafia days, he opened up his own social club named the Sinatra Club. Many mobsters would come to this club, even when there were all-out wars going on between different families. They would come to the Sinatra Club and play cards. Some of the mobsters that played with these cards were John Gotti, Dominic Cataldo, Tommy D. Simone, Foxy, Jimmy Burke, Willie Boyd Johnson, Tony Roach, Henry Hill, Joe DeFiti, Danny Fatico, Gene Gotti, Peter Gotti, Joey Scopo, and many more. We're selling each one of these cards for $10 a piece. These cards are limited. We only got a thousand of them. The next item is an autographed picture of Sal from his Mafia days. Another item is the Dinner with the Mobster card. You can get this autographed as well. This was an event that Sal had hosted in the past. We also got the Ubots production ticket from an event that Sal had hosted. This is also autographed. The last item we got to offer is Sal's book, The Sins of the Father. Again, you can find all these items in the video description below.